Susanna, Beth, can you hear me online? Yeah, Give me a little reaction yeah. if you can. So it's glad to see some good folks today as we kind of have our Black History Month kickoff or kickoff. It's the end of the month. Keynote is the word I'm trying to find here. Uh, I'm going to let our guest presenters introduce themselves. Uh, I'm happy to see all of you here. Please, if you're done with that lunch, there's more lunch out in the hallway. <laughs> so you can have more than one online friends. I don't have lunch for you unless you want to come over here and drive over. I'll ship it over. I, maybe DoorDash will take it over that way. So. <laughs> Uh, but it's a pleasure to have our friends with us. Um, and Professor Lowe, I'll let you start off and introduce everyone who's with us. All right. Well, I just want to thank everybody for coming out. My name is Melissa Lowe, uh, RN, clinical instructor here from Mount Carmel College of Nursing. I've been here for about eight years, and I just want to put this out there. Uh, I retired from OSU, uh, OSU Medical Center, and after I retired, I worked for several schools as clinical instructors. And then I wanted to limit it down to one. I worked for Columbus State, uh, Capitol, Chamberlain, Mount Carmel, COTC. And um, I didn't really know which school that I wanted to remain with, but I just thought about the students here at Mount Carmel, and I decided Mount Carmel was going to be my place. Oh my God! Dr. Baumgartner, uh, I decided Mount Carmel was going to be the place that I was going to stay. So anyhow, we have wonderful students here, and I thank you for coming out for the Black History Month. And we just want to present our, our book that we did during COVID. It's the history that we will never forget, and we want nurses to stay in the profession. So that's a little bit about my background. And then we have our president here, and her name is Janice Smith. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, and then as we go down um, telling our stories, each one of our uh, colleagues will introduce themselves. Um, but I am the president of the Columbus Black Nurses Association, and I'd like to start with a prayer. We meet once a month, the Columbus Black Nurses Association, and I always start our meetings. We've been meeting on Zoom and in person since COVID is getting back, so we can go and meet personally, but I always start with the prayer. And I say, Lord, as we gather here today, we ask that you will help us make good decisions that will be pleasing to you and everyone. Let us be productive in all areas of our lives as we do the work of helping people. We welcome each one of you to the Black Nurses Association. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And I want to tell you a little bit about our organization. We are part of the National Black Nurses Association, and we do mentoring. If you need a professional mentor, if you need a speaker, if you need continued education, CEUs. We also um, do health screenings. Like several, we did about eight health screenings last year. We did the Black Expo. We did the, the um, uh, African American Male Walk. We did the Lift You Up. We did so many health screenings. And when we do our health screenings, we usually do acu checks, blood pressure checks, um, body mass, weight, and we educate the public. And that's part of what the uh, Columbus Black Nurses Association does. Um, we also um, educate nurses, student nurses, all the way up to PhDs, mm -hmm. and we mentor all of them. Mm -hmm. And um, we recently wrote a book, The Voices of Black Nurses During COVID, Our Challenges and Triumphs During That Time. And we, we uh, I think Black history is not just for a month, it's every day. 
you can celebrate Black history. And um, we wrote this book in collaboration to talk about our experiences, because my experience when we, when um, I'm one of the senior nurses in this group, and when um, virtual learning came, I'm like, okay, what is it? What is virtual learning? And I, we, we were sitting in a meeting, and our, our dean of the school said, COVID's coming. It's coming our way. And I said, this invisible monster is coming for all of us. <laughs> and, and we had to shut down. People had to wear masks, wash your hands, get vaccines. A lot of people were resistant because they were scared. But we had to enforce it and talk about it. And as we were talking about, we were going to go virtual and learn, have to learn how to teach virtually. I was a lab instructor. I said, how am I going to teach lab as a lab instructor? So first we had to shut down totally and do virtually till we could open up a little bit one day a month to touch them because we could not release them unless we knew they knew how to put a Foley in. They knew how to give an eye injection. They knew how to um, treat patients, put an NG tube in, put a Foley in. So they had to come to lab. So, but at first we had to teach them how to do it virtually till they could get to that point. So the nurse that was sitting beside me, she started to cry. <laughs> I said, what are you crying about? You're younger than me. You know more about the computers and all that. She said, I know it, but it's going to be rough. It's going to be rough. It's hard enough teaching them in person. Now we have to do it virtually. So we had to learn how to do this virtually. Show videos, test them, quiz them, get them to interact while, you, while you're doing virtually. So how do you get them to interact virtually? You test them. You tell them to raise your hand. You call them out. And I did that, and, and it, it was a challenge. And at home, I had two dogs. I had my daughter had a chocolate lab, and I had a um, wild wilder, and they would lay at my feet while I was teaching. So <laughs> one day, one day, I heard snoring, <laughs> and I thought it was a student with their their mic on. And here it was the dog. <laughs> I had to push my feet to wake the dog up. And then I get every hour of teaching because it's hard to sit there virtually. Every hour of teaching, I have to give at least 10 minute break. So one day I gave a 10 minute break and I went to get me some coffee and a chocolate lab sat in a chair. <laughs> like with her nose on the pad, like she was teaching. And I could hear some students that, that was still off the mic started laughing. I'm like, what are they laughing about? And she was the chocolate lab was sitting at, the, <laughs> at my computer. <laughs> so I was like, oh my goodness. But it was challenging. <laughs> but the one thing that I wrote in my book is I wrote that I wish everyone could take a class in microbiology so they could know what this monster was like and put your mask on, get your vaccines, protect yourself. And if you don't want to protect yourself, protect people around you. Mm -hmm. And that was a challenge. And my favorite, my favorite ending to our book, um, the last sentence in our book, it was uh, one of our LPNs because um, the nurses that, there's 30 nurses that wrote in this book. And um, they were student nurses, RNs, LPNs, PhDs, everyone. And our student, our, our LPN nurse, she wrote the last, um, she wrote the last chapter in a book. And the last sentence in the book says, I'm an optimistic person about the future. The storm doesn't always last. This too shall pass. Mm -hmm. That was the last sentence in the book, and which I love. And also, I um, also said people need people to survive. Mm -hmm. And I just want to tell why I became a nurse. Um, I was about 10 years old, and I had to get my tonsils out. I have a twin brother. I have twins. Um, and um, let me back up a little bit. Um, I'm a registered nurse. I've been a registered nurse for over 42 years. I have a bachelor's science degree in nursing. Um, I have twins and I have um, two grandchildren. And I started working at um, 
at Ohio State, but when I was uh, 10 years old, I wanted to be a nurse because I had to get my tonsils out and a black nurse. Back then, it was unusual to see a black nurse. And she said, Janice, I need you to go to your room. I have to give you some medicine. I looked up. I was amazed. <laughs> I went to my room. She said, I need to. She had a tray. And you know, back there, they had the metal trays with the metal needles and everything. But she didn't say she had to give me a shot. She said, I have to give you some medicine. So I went back to my room and she said, I got to give it in your backside. My gluteus back. I said, OK. She gave me that injection. I could hardly feel it. And she said, you lay there for a few minutes and you could go back to the game room and play. My twin brother was in there. We both were getting our tonsils out. So I got up a few minutes later and I just went in the hallway and I just watched her walk up the hallway. She had that big white cap on, white stiff dress, white perfect shoes, spotless shoes. And I said, I want to be her when I grow up. I want to be a nurse. And then that's when I started to travel that lane of being a nurse. Then I said, I know I have to do math. I know I have to read books. I love science. So I started doing that and reading medical books and everything. And I saw a picture of a nurse in scrubs and with the mask on and everything going to the OR. So when I was in my pediatric rotation, I had a, a baby who was getting had a hernia. I was getting surgery. So I got to go into surgery with that baby. And I thought, that's what that book, I saw myself there. <laughs> and I had to stand right by the surgeon. I was so nervous, but my, my instructor said, I want you to study about this hernia surgery in case they ask you any questions. So I did. So sure enough, the surgeon asked me some questions. He picked up a bubble of tissue after he opened, made an incision and opened up the baby. He said, what is this fluid inside this bubble? So everybody, everybody in the OR was looking at the student nurse, looking at me. I said, it's peritoneal fluid. <laughs> he looked at me, he said, you're right. <laughs> you're going to be a good nurse. You want to be a nurse? I said, I, I'm not sure what nurse I want to be yet, but I want to be a nurse. But it was a fabulous experience. <laughs> and I just want to tell one other little story. And um, then I'll let, let my other nurses talk, because I'm going to talk again at the end. Um, I, was, I told you I was a clinical instructor. I had a student that was on a bubble, pasted on a bubble. She didn't know if she was going to pass or fail. She, her, her kids were sick that quarter, so she didn't get to study with the study group. So her classmates were saying, we're going to leave you. We're going we're gonna to move on to the next quarter. She was so sad because she had to get an 85 on her final to pass. So I had to open a new bottle of smart water. I said, here, take this smart water and <laughs> You drink it and you study and hydrate. It has electrolytes in it, it'll make you feel good. And you take your final. So the following week, when she came to lab, she was smiling. So I said, How, how'd you do? She said, I got a 90. I only had to get an 85. And so I said, she said, it was the smart water. It was the smart water. <laughs> I, said, <laughs> I said, no, you had it in you all the time. You just needed some encouragement. Um, the smart water uh, helped hydrate you, but you actually did it. So she was she was happy and pleased. So very good. I'll let uh, Joyce go next because I'm going to speak again at the end. You can, you can go, Joyce. <laughs> um, my name is Joyce. <laughs> uh, what can I say? Um, originally, I'm from Kenya. I wasn't going to become a nurse, tell you the truth. I, um, I was going to go to medical school, but then there was a missionary who came in um, to our home and she was talking about nursing and all the other stuff. And she was a teacher at uh, Cedarville University. So to me, I was coming to America. I didn't even care. I was like, okay, I'm coming to America, that's all. I didn't know anything about nursing because little village girl, what do I know? So I came here in January wearing slippers. I didn't know how <laughs> snow was, how snow looked like or anything. Slippers and uh, just a dress. Those guys looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> um, anyway, so that was my through nursing school. 
having the challenge of also speaking different languages. Originally, English, even though Kenya was an English-speaking country, I grew up speaking French. So now coming to flip it, uh, one of the biggest thing was when the instructor would say some things, I'd be like, would you mind, you know, speak English? So the only way they could translate for me. So I'll tell them, would you speak English? So one day they talked about uh, prune. I'd never heard of a prune. I'd never seen a prune. <laughs> so uh, Mark Klemek was my instructor brought a whole new jug of prune to show me what a prune looks like. And after I finished that, um, worked as a traveler, went back home and worked because I couldn't work in the US as a foreign student. My visa had expired, so I had to go back home. And worked, I worked at home and worked in different countries too. Then later on, I got a chance to come back to the US and worked as a travel nurse. And then through that, um, I used that experience also to go back and teach. So I went back to school, got my master's in nursing education. And in the process of teaching, I also decided to continue working because I was like, for you to, I wanted to make sure what I'm teaching the students, it's what was there, that I was current. So I was teaching more clinical at Fortis College, and then I was also teaching overseas. When the pand then pandemic happened, I'd gone to Kenya, come back, and I was also working with United uh, World Health Organization. So I'd worked with United World Health Organization during Ebola. So then when I came here, nobody was putting on a mask or anything. So I'm getting reported had a patient who was sick, literally had all the symptoms. So in the process of getting reports, because it just happened that I was being given report outside the room, not in the room as we were supposed to. So I went and put on a mask. And my manager said, no, you can't do that. You're scaring the patient. And at that time, nobody knew what COVID was. It was just the thing. And I'm like, we need to. So I wrote a letter to the CNO and everybody said, no, this is what I'm seeing outside. It's happening in other countries. If US is not caught up, you know. So one of the thing I wrote here was how during the, when COVID started, we were rationing everything. I don't know if any of you could remember. Uh, we wore masks for a whole week, one mask. If you left your mask, especially N95, somebody would steal it. Mm -hmm. um, we, the gloves, you were rationing everything. So if you went to even get the PPE, you had to ask for permission, why do you need it? And um, so being in a country like US, things have been rushed, you're wondering why. Because we always gave people outside. You know, the, the ones who are giving everything. And then here we are, we're not taking care of the vulnerable. Who, who are, we are the ones. So I stopped teaching clinicals. I kept working on the floor because now clinicals were stopped. And like she said, everything went virtual. So I had to support myself and support people back home. In that process, the patients were dying. We were seeing patients dying every day. Some of us were also dying. I got sick from uh, with COVID too. I was one of the few nurses who got sick for the first few. And just one of the biggest thing with it, when you were sick, you, you couldn't explain it to anybody what was going on with you. And you can't explain it to your family members because family members don't understand. The community didn't understand. But also one funny thing I used to tell people with the African communities, people had made, they were making concussions. So people bring the concussions, leave it at my door. But they'll not talk to me, they'll leave it at the door and make sure that I drink it. And I'll say, if COVID doesn't kill me, the concussions. <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't only just people from Kenya, it was other African and Indians, everybody. The immigrants were giving us all these concussions. Everybody was like, 
this is this will help you so you don't get covered at that time i didn't tell anybody that i was even had been sick in the hospital in that process too you were scared because if you didn't see your co-worker the following day you are wondering oh my goodness did she go so in that we i got a community of african nurses because one of my friends had already died in new york so we had different colors because we didn't know who to talk to. If you went to the psychiatrist or the psychologist, they give you medicine instead of just letting you speak. I just want to vent because in a day would see when maybe 10 people dying or so, you know, it was just like the conveyor belt. You know, somebody's dead, you go and get, clean the room, you put another person. So that was our life as nurses and not only were we dealing with our patients dying here and friends even back home people were dying the only good thing in the u.s you could go to the emergency room and you'll be treated with no uh, payment first but in africa even up to today with any disease you have to put some payments down so with COVID, it was 10,000 American dollars for someone. You go to the emergency room, nobody's going to touch that patient. So people were dying because of that. So in the African community, we were doing fundraising among ourselves so that you could send home money to treat. So you had that pressure and this pressure of coming, working here. So that's one of the reasons why when they talked about writing the the book. So I was like, you know, with Ebola, we were uh, we were prepped and we were ready. Uh, even with other patients with SARS, I brought a patient here, but I was ready for that patient. This one, no. Nobody taught us how to be ready with this pandemic. So that was one scary uh, thing that you're like, okay, will I be next? Will I be the one that people are coming for my funeral? Mm -hmm. So that was a big thing with the COVID thing. Yeah. But otherwise, we came through it. Thank God. Thank you, Joyce. OK, so my name is Stephanie McCoy. I am a clinical education consultant with Becton Dickinson. I am also a graduate of Mount Carmel College in Nursing, 2000, the class of 2003. So it's a great honor to walk back through these hallways after almost 20 years, because May of 2003 is when I graduated from here. So it's like 20 years later. I'm like, oh, my. So um, the challenges and triumphs as a nurse working for a medical technology company um, as a clinical education consultant i work in the infusion professional services um, i'm sure you are aware of the alaris system um, the iv pumps that you see a lot in the hospitals um, is that smart pump that has you, like your large volume pump your syringe your pca and your end title well i'm the educator so anytime a hospital purchase the Alaris device, if it's in my territory, I cover the Midwest, which is about 17 states. So I do a lot of traveling, weekly travel prior to the pandemic. Um, but when a customer purchased our device, I will work with the hospital nurse educator, the project manager, the account executive, the pharmacy consultant, and we will create the education for the nurses. So if this hospital has 1,250 nurses, I'm creating that education schedule, making sure that we have enough um, clinical consultants or agency consultants to come help um, support the education and also support the go live after um, prior to them going live with the new device. So um, that is what I currently do. Um, I did work at Riverside Methodist Hospital. I started out at the age of 19 as a patient escort and worked my way up until like 27 years of service where I um, actually retired from Riverside in um, 2018. So my background as far as a nurse, um, most of the care areas that I worked um, for, it was all around cardiac. So um, once I graduated from Mount Carmel, of course, um, 
I wanted to work for the Mount Carmel system, but I already had so many years in at Riverside. I just said, let me just stay with Riverside because, you know, back then, you know, they would help with, you know, paying for the tuition and stuff here at um, MCCN. So continue working at Riverside in this cardiac step down unit and eventually move my way up um, cardiac ICU uh, worked. Um, well, I went to school at University of Phoenix, where I received my master's in nursing education. I was also a visiting professor for Chamberlain, so um, during those years. And then before I left Riverside, I was working in the Neuroscience Infusion Center as an infusion nurse. And so once I was finishing up my master's in nursing education, I saw the position for Becton Dickinson. And I was like, well, this is an educator's role and, you know, it requires some traveling. I said, so I, of course, I applied for it. Um, I was offered the position and I've been with BD ever since. I'm sure you are very familiar with BD because we were like one of the leading um, medical technology companies. If you ever see a pizza machine, that's BD. If you need all your BD um, syringes, um, if you open up a pack, it says BD, that's Becton Dickinson, your insulin syringes. Um, BD also um, acquired BARD, so your Foley catheters that a lot of hospital, um, patients, that's now a part of BD. So BD is actually acquiring a lot of these smaller uh, medical technology companies. It's a very diverse um, company to work for. Um, it's, you know, our focus and our goal is, you know, to improve the health of, you know, patients in the world. So I really enjoy what I do as a clinical education consultant. Um, the reason why I became a nurse, it was a calling, um, you know, working at Riverside as a patient escort, seeing how um, nurses were caring for patients and I'm transporting them to various departments. Um, I, I was very intrigued, especially in the critical care area, all those lines and drips and, you know, so I said, okay, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? You know, cause I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, but then it wasn't until I really inquired from God, Lord, what is it that you have designed for me? You know, I, I got a lot of confirmation. Strangers would come up to me and say, you look like a registered nurse. You look like a nurse, you, look, you know? And I'm like, okay, I think that's my confirmation. <laughs> so I enrolled at Columbus State and I went through um, their program. And then of course I transferred here and graduated in 2003. And so uh, it has been very rewarding. It's truly an awesome profession because there's so many different things that you can do um, in nursing and now, with technology and smart pumps, you ha may have heard the um, term interoperability. Well, interoperability is when the Allaire system talks to the electronic me medical records. So if you have Epic or Cerner or Iatrix, those, um, those EMR vendors um, working for BD in the infusion professional services and working with the Allaire system. That's another piece of um, nursing that you can use, especially nurses that are interested in nursing informatics. Um, you know, they are definitely looking for those types of nurses to help, you know, create those clinical workflows and, and you know, read those HL7 messaging so that the pump can communicate to your electronic medical records and, you know, feed information back and forth. So being on the uh, corporate side of nursing is very different than being at the clinical bedside. It took me a while, you know, to learn the corporate way of doing things, but I still get to interact with um, nurses whenever I am going to different sites. Um, I so I still get to talk to them. Um, I love, you know, teaching and showing them how to make your day a lot smoother by programming the pump this way, you know, because there's a lot of features of the Allaire system that if you don't get that formal training from um, one of the consultants, you know, we, we learn from our preceptors and it might not, they may not know the features that's available to make your job a little easier. You know, maybe that delay feature um, showing, you know, making sure that the head heights are, you know, accurate according to what the uh, manufacturer recommends. So I really enjoy um, what I do. The pandemic really impacted my 
uh, my travel because prior to I would fly out on Mondays, fly home on Fridays if I was, you know, somewhere in the United States. Um, now, uh, when the pandemic started, we had to change our way of educating. So, of course, we went virtual to where we would actually teach the nurse educator that was assigned to the project how to train their staff on the Alara system. And we may dial in and we would dial in remotely and provide that support, you know. So that was a way of, you know, us still continuing to support our customers during the pandemic, but not actually be on site. So now we are starting to get back out there a little more. Customers are able to um, use days that they have purchased whenever they purchase the device. Um, to have us come back out and retrain nurses because if their compliance is low when it comes to programming using guardrails, then they can reach out to us We and, you know, we will get that case and then go back out and retrain the nurses. So travel is picking up, um, which is a great thing. But of course, we have to be very cautious and follow whatever the hospital's policies are for vendors because I'm considered a vendor when, of course, I go into the um, hospital. So. So that is what I do. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I guess it's my turn. Um, most people that know me know I don't have a loss of words, <laughs> <laughs> and I can be very long-winded. But I uh, kind of have a loss of words right now. But I'm just going to go with what I feel right now. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about my background. Born and raised, I'm born and raised on the west side here. I'm a west side, west side. But anyhow, uh, <laughs> so when I first, my first image of nursing was my mom. She was, uh, she was a nurse, and she went to Mount, not Mount Carmel. She went to Grant School of Nursing, and I would always see her in the white uniforms and the pantyhose, the white pantyhose and the hat, and you know the, the shoes that were, you know polished I had to polish the shoes every every <laughs> week or so but anyhow so I knew at age four that I wanted to be a nurse um, so I I took the courses in high school that required me to be able to 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 be a nurse or enter into nursing school but financially I, I couldn't afford it and I knew my family couldn't afford it so um, I was I started out as a candy striper here at Mount Carmel West um, as a candy striper. So when I was old enough to work, you know, like a regular job, um, I decided, okay, well, I'm gonna apply here at Mount Carmel West. And so the human resource person said, we don't have any openings right now, but we have an opening in environmental service. Back then they called it housekeeping. And I thought, I don't really want to do that. I kind of want to be like a nurse aide or I want to, you know, but I really wanted to work too, and I wanted to get the experience. So I took the job. Um, it, it was very enlightening. I learned a lot in that department. Uh, when a position came open as a nurse aide, I worked in the, uh, what they called the intermediate step down unit. So I was a nurse aide. And I can tell you about, <laughs> that, was, that was a scary experience because I was like right out of high school. And I was a nurse aide and I had a mentor. You know, I always had really, really good mentors. I mean, even now I have Dr. Bumgartner and the staff here, the uh, faculty here, great mentors. But anyhow, I had this uh, older nurse aide that took me under her wing. Uh, but she wasn't with me when a, pa a patient passed out. A patient, um, I remember clear as day, I walked into the room and this was an open heart it was an intermediate step down unit, but they had an open heart patients on that unit. So this patient uh, passed out and I'm here, I am like 18 or something like that. Never ever saw anybody pass out before. And the patient passed out and I froze. I didn't know what to do. And I could feel, excuse me, everybody online. I could feel urine run down my pant leg. And I was just like froze. I didn't know what to do. And so my mentor, she came and she put her arm around me and she, they took me out the room. <laughs> well, I'll never forget that. And 
it was it was because of my mentor that I survived that because I was like done after that. I was like, I don't think this is for me because I mean, how could I just like freeze like that? And um, but there's certain certain moments in nursing that you'll never forget. And one thing I like about Mount Carmel is that we do what we call reflections. And we 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 try to do my my students know some of them, like I said, are here. Uh, we try to do our reflections every morning before we start our day, but that really kind of helps us to reflect on how we can become better nurses. So anyhow, I worked for, like I said, Mount Carmel until I went to nursing school. Um, I went to what was called um, C, uh, Columbus Technical Institute, which is Columbus State Community College now. And so I went there and um, it, it was a pretty, pretty hectic, it was a pretty rigorous uh, program. And um, so my one of my clinical rotations was at Grant Medical Center. Mm -hmm. And um, I was kind of like a C student because I had to work. And then when I got out, some of you might do this now where you work night shift, <laughs> then you got to go to class as soon, at eight o'clock as soon as you get off from uh, school or as soon as you get off from work, you got to go to clinicals, not clinicals, but classroom lecture, and then you would have clinicals. Well, anyhow, I, um, I, when I worked at, um, uh, when I had clinicals at Grant, there was this um, nurse. I don't know why she took a liking to me, but she was very um, intelligent, and she looked really, you know, just professional and was was always willing to, even if I wasn't assigned to her, she would always come and ask how I was doing and everything like that. And then she asked me, she said, you know what, um, you should um, come and join the Columbus Black Nurses Association. I said, well, what is that? And she was telling me about, um, you know, how there were mentors there and I could study and, you know, she just, I don't know, it was something about her. I just didn't, I just didn't do it when she told me. But there was a uh, junior class, like the class that some of you guys are in now, 309. I wasn't doing very well in that. In fact, um, back then, what we had to do was when we took a test, we uh, got our scores. And after, after you took the test, you had to go look at your scores on the wall. Some of you older nurses might remember that. <laughs> you'd go outside the class and then you'd, you'd look for your name and then you Oh man, so it was always that anxiety. I think you just get your scores right after you take the test now, but we would go and I look and I was always like one point behind. So, uh, but to make a long story short, um, this mentor, I mean, she worked with me, she studied with me. However, I, I missed the course, I missed passing my junior level class by one point. Um, you know how like, and I know you guys can relate to this, there's like these test questions that you, you know, everybody disputes them and then you get credit. Well, everybody got credit. I didn't get credit, so I missed by one point. So I had to retake uh, my junior level, which is your 309 now. I had to repeat that. So, but you know, those are, that was, that was a very um, crazy, crazy time. I really didn't know if I was gonna make it. But anyhow, I made it through, I graduated. I ended up being the uh, vice president um, of my class um, at that time. So, but I had, like I said, I always had a mentor, someone that I could run things by or, um, you know, just, they just, I think organizations are good for students and you never know when you're gonna need to uh, run something by someone, you know, to give you some <laughs> advice and not be judgmental about, you know, giving you that advice. So moving on to what it was like um, during COVID. So I, I know some of you know that I do fitness outside of here. That, that was another thing that really, um, a passion that I have is fitness and I'm a Pilates instructor. But anyhow, I have some girlfriends that I've been working with. Uh, you know, we've been friends for a long time and they're fitness instructors. And a couple times a year we get together um, so when I noticed something was going on, um, it was Thanksgiving 2019, and we were about ready to go on Thanksgiving break. And you guys know we get a couple of days, and then of course you have Christmas break, 
And um, so what I try to do as a clinical instructor is to try to give students what they're learning in class, the classroom setting. So let's say they're on diabetes or they're on endocrine system or they're on, you know, oncology. I try to find those page patients and match them up with what's going on in the classroom setting. And so around Thanksgiving time, I noticed that I couldn't match the page patients up with what was going on in class. What I was seeing was a lot of patients had this like bronchitis, flu, pneumonia, and this went on for a while. And I'm like thinking to myself, is it me or what is going on? Why do I have all these respiratory uh, patients? And I said, this is, I don't, I don't like this because the fact their care plans are based off, their care plans or concept maps are based off the patients that they have. So I was like, I need some variation. So that's when I started noticing something's, something's up. And they were really sick. And there weren't beds, there weren't enough beds to fill, uh, you know, there was like, we was on what we call diversion a lot of the time. And I just kept thinking to myself, what, I don't, I said to myself, I don't know what's going on, but I know I have been through Ebola, I've been through H1N1, I've been through HIV when that came out. I know some of you nurses that are older kind of remember that. And some of these nurses here may remember back in the day, we didn't wear gloves. Like if someone had a, a bowel movement, we would just take a washcloth, you know, kind of like the way you clean a baby, you would just, you know, use the washcloth and fold it over. So I had been through a lot of things already. So I said to myself, whatever is going on, I'm just going to use good hand washing technique because something's going on. So anyhow, getting back to the story with my um, clinicals here at Mount Carmel, I was at Mount Carmel East. Um, I said to myself, well, okay, so spring break, I'm gonna get together with my friends. I'm so excited. That's like excitement time for me. And I had to end up canceling because I got really sick. And the only thing I thought about was I got to feel better before I go back to clinicals because Nobody wants to do a makeup. That ain't gonna happen. So I just said, well, you know what? On on Thanksgiving break, I'm gonna eat chicken noodle soup. I'm gonna do what I can, but I gotta be good. So when I go back and and students, I'll be ready for the students. So anyhow, I kind of wonder at that. I kind of think back. Did I have COVID and didn't even know it back then? Was I being exposed? But I knew I used, like I said, uh, universal precautions and good hand washing. It could have been anything. But anyhow, <laughs> so that was a little story about when I first discovered in my mind something was going on. Then in January 2020, um, this is on page 71 in the book. That's when I, you know, noticed, okay, so we got, we have something going on here. It was called coronavirus at that time. And um, then we, I'm checking my time because, you know, I can't get a little long-winded. <laughs> so, so in 2020, uh, January 2020, that's when it kind of, kind of started coming out, something was going on. And so uh, we had a lot of travelers, not a lot, but we had travelers. And I'm going to call this person's name out because he always made me laugh. His name was Stone, and he was kind of like a comedian. So uh, Stone says, uh, we're at the nursing station. You know, I don't know what, you know, you got the, the AccuCheck machines at the nursing station. So we were kind of congregating around the nursing station. So Stone comes up to me, and he says, hey, Melissa, did you hear that we have a COVID patient down in the ER. I said, what? Uh, we all, everybody's ears just like went up like antennas. And we were like, what? Are you kidding? And we were like, we were like, where are they gonna put them? Where are they gonna put them? Are they gonna put them up here? And we were just like, oh no, uh-uh, that can't, that, that patient can't come up here. We were all scared because we didn't know what to expect. But, but Stone was the one that initially put that out there that we were going to get a patient or uh, there was one in the ED that had, because, it, it, you know, on the news it was other states. And then it came to Ohio and it was actually one in the ED at Mount Carmel. I was like, oh my God, I don't, I, you know, I'm not ready for this. But anyhow, so uh, that week passed and then we came back 
Um, we came back and then the whole unit, my unit turned into a COVID unit. I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and so it, it was weird walking into a hospital setting and you saw isolation carts down the hall. It was quiet. You could hear a pin drop. And it was just so weird. I had never, if you had, I don't know if you went to the hospital during the COVID, uh, you know, when it was in its height or peak, it was the most, it, it, it was so weird walking in to see that. So anyhow, um, uh, so I think I went on another break or spring break, and then we came back, the whole unit was COVID. I was calling Dr. Bumgartner almost every week. I said, <laughs> I know she probably got tired of me, but anyhow, I called her, I said, hey, uh, Hey, I don't know what's going on here, but this is what's going on. And she would always give me good advice, another good mentor, like I said. Then um, one day I came to clinicals and a nurse came up to me uh, because, you know, they, you know, I'm kind of friends with a lot of the nurses because I've been with Mount Cromwell, like I said, if I had mentioned eight years and most of my clinicals have been between here and east. So a nurse came up to me, she said, Melissa, I don't know if anybody told you, but this unit's closing tomorrow. She said, um, we're going to move to such and such unit, and it's going to be a whole bigger unit, and it's going to be all, they're sending all the COVID patients here. I said, what? I said, what? And she, because, you know, on the other unit we had, at least we had a few patients that we could take care of. Sometimes, you know, sometimes we had to double up because we there were so many COVID patients. So she comes to me, it was like around noon, and she says, yeah, we're moving tomorrow, nobody told you, and here I have all these other weeks to go with the students. Um, and I was like, oh my God, are you kidding me? And so I didn't know what to do, and the students were, I know they could kind of tell something was going on, but they didn't know <coughs> what. So I finally pulled them all together, and I said, hey, you guys, I said, we're going to have to pray. I said, because I, I really don't know what's going to happen. Um, this unit is turning into a COVID unit. And they like the unit, you know, because we got to do a lot of skills. So anyhow, long story short, um, I didn't know what to do. So I was kind of walking down the hall, and I must have had this sad look on my face because everybody I pass in the hospital, I always speak to them. And so I said, um, one of the directors, she said, hey, Melissa, is everything okay? And I said, and, and I'll call her name out. Her name is uh, Robin Razor. She said, uh, is everything okay? And I said, uh, no. And I kind of had this like distant look. I said, no, I said, the unit's gonna, I said, the unit's gonna turn into a COVID unit. And um, we don't have any place to do clinicals. And she said, well, you can do clinicals on my unit. I said, what, on your unit? <laughs> and so, and then I was excited but then again, I was intimidated and scared at the same time because her unit was an SIMCU unit with, it, it was much more critical. And I hadn't done critical care type stuff for a while. So I was excited. I called uh, Dr. Bumgartner and told her she made the uh, arrangements and we got it all set up. But when I went on that unit, um, there were a lot of nurses that, that were like, I don't think students should be here. This is a little too critical for them. You know, so I had to develop that bond and help them to trust us and develop, you know, like a, a relationship with the nurses on the unit. And then they finally were able to trust that the students are going to be accountable and do what they're supposed to do, you know. But that took a while to get there because half the time I didn't know what I, I ain't gonna say I didn't know what I was doing. I just hadn't done it for a while because I come from a critical care setting at OSU. So, but anyhow, um, I'm just gonna tell you one more story and I'm gonna stop. Okay, okay, I'll stop. There's one more story. But so that was that. And we got accustomed to the uh, skills and the, the things that we had to do on this SIMCU unit with junior students. Then my biggest highlight during the pandemic is when the school announced that we, the students were gonna help give COVID shots. I had never seen behind the scene of what that looked like. And so the students were practicing, you know, they knew how to give injections, but they hadn't given a whole, if you have, I understand you got a link. But uh, anyhow, so that we're giving COVID, we assisted giving COVID shots. 
we started out, uh, okay, so the, the community would come in and they would get the COVID vaccines. And so they would come in and I didn't realize, okay, we started out with 300 injections one week. And then the next time we did it, I'm not talking about one week, I'm talking about 300 injections from like eight o'clock to two o'clock. And you could not waste any of the injections. And so the next time we came back, we were given 500 to 600 injections per day. And you couldn't waste any of that. And we weren't drawing them up. It was very uh, organized. I'm sure some of you got, you got your COVID shots and remember what that was like. But the students were such a big help. They never, some of those days, they never would have made it without the students. But they, you know, they got the swing of it. They got, you know, we had like nurse injectors and, and we would give the injections and they would watch them um, and, and those kinds of things. So, but uh, I want to leave you with one thing before I um, move on here. We only have a couple minutes. Um, you know, we really, uh, I kind of felt like, no, maybe I, maybe it wasn't. I'm not going. I'm going to say I think some of the nurses kind of felt like they weren't valued during the COVID transition, but we soon realized that COVID really helped us to realize that we need nurses in this profession. Every body needs a nurse when they go to the hospital, and I do see a lot of. Uh, shifting of positions right now. Uh, we have a lot of travelers on our unit every week. You know, we don't get the same nurse. It's being ran by travelers, which I love travelers. Actually, I, I wanted to travel, you know, at, I have my license in, in three other states, but I just want to say that we need nurses and we need consistency, you know. So anyhow, um, I just wanted to say it's a great profession and you can do whatever you want. And I thank you guys for being here. I'm going to turn it over to Janice, who's going yes. to close. Janice, she's yes. going to close. And uh, yeah. thank and, you for letting us be here. Yeah, in, in closing, I just want to summarize. That's why we wrote the book. Because we wrote it as a fundraiser. We need nurses and scholarships. And our organization, the Columbus Black Nurses Association, is a nonprofit organization that we provide and care for the underserved. And we want to treat all ethnic groups and help bring them into the healthcare system. Everyone in this room right now, everyone is a superhero. We were superheroes before the pandemic. We worked at the bedside taking care of people, taking care of the public. And since COVID, nurses are trying to get away from the profession because they're burnt out. So we're trying to raise money um, to bring more nurses and provide scholarships and mentor and educate. So that's why we wrote the book, The Voices of Black Nurses in Our Challenges and Triumphants. So I just wanted to, um, Give that information, anybody interested, or you know anyone that wants to become a nurse, our organization is to help. We provide scholarships, mentor, and educate. And so I just want to say a closing prayer also, because we want to give out, I'm going to give out some prizes. I gave, we gave out um, tickets. I'm going to give out some books, smart water. And um, thank you for having us. <laughs> I just want to say a quick prayer. Yes, our, my prayer is, Nursing is no easy feat. It requires knowledge, skill, drive, compassion. God bless us as, as you show us your favor. Keep us safe, healthy, and strong as we serve. Until we meet again, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, there is a class that's about to take a uh, midterm exam, so we're just going to draw real quick. If you want to, if you're not present, then we'll just uh, give it to the next person. <laughs> now, now, this we'll give the it. online people, we have your name in here too for books or prizes. This first one goes to the last three digits, 724. Uh, damn, so come no, pick. You want a book, a smart water, pen, scissors? What do you want? Come on over and get it. All right. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> the next one is 904. That's me. Yay. All right. You get what you want. A book, smart water, scissors, pens, more scissors. Here, take the smart water. Now that we know what's oh, going on. Oh, oh, that's oh, right. I forgot. She gets like hundreds on all exams. I forgot. The next one is 905. That's me. Uh oh. That's nice. That's before you leave. Do you have any questions for our organization? No, but I you are questions. wonderful storytellers and yeah. I so thoroughly oh. enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Joyce.